we're talking about the Supreme Court talking about gun control. Or more specifically, gun control control. The law being challenged here was a New York City law that said a specific group of legal handgun owners couldn't take their handguns out of city limits. Huh. We New Yorkers hate guns so much that we force them to live and stay in the city. Now this led to New Yorkers doing what we really do best, getting really angry and suing somebody. Specifically, the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association sued the city of New York because they wanted to be able to take their guns outside of the city limits to a gun shooting range or to their second homes. Now this concern was, of course, handled incredibly delicately by the city of New York. The city, by the way, said to the guy with the other house, if you can afford another house, you can afford another gun. Ah, <sighs> there's the sympathy this city is so famous for. Now things were not going well for the New York gun enthusiasts. After a federal district court and the United States Court of Appeals upheld the ban, the gun owners went to the Supreme Court. Now this is where things get strange, because all of a sudden the Big Apple did a complete about face, reversed the law, and gave the handgun owners everything they demanded. Then over the summer, the city urged the justices to dismiss the case before it could be argued. Explaining that, because it had repealed the ban and the state had changed its laws, the gun owners had received everything they had asked for. So what the heck happened? New York was on a legal winning streak, then all of a sudden we were giving the defendants everything they wanted and then begging the Supreme Court not to take the case. Well, the Supreme Court right now really likes gun rights. I'm talking even more than your uncle. You know the one. Now this left New York with two options. You can either fight this ban to the top, open up the second amendment for legal reinterpretation, and have this regulation probably declared unconstitutional so nobody could ever implement something similar again. Or you do what New York did and give up, keep the second amendment out of the Supreme Court, and hope this all blows over. As SCOTUS blog notes, Conventional wisdom suggested that this spelled trouble for restrictive gun rights regulations nationwide, as it would give the Supreme Court a chance to address what some have characterized as consistent under enforcement of the Second Amendment in the lower courts. Of course, based on the title of this video, I think you can guess what happened next. Well, today the U.S. Supreme Court will take up the first gun rights case in nearly a decade. Handgun owners are challenging a New York law that limits the transportation of guns. That law has since, we should note, been amended, but the case is moving forward regardless, with some gun rights advocates framing it as a test of the Second Amendment. Yeah, <laughs> New York City really misplayed their hand on this one. With that context, let's get into the oral arguments. Now this set of arguments was a bit strange because you could really see that the wind was totally taken out of the gun rights lawyers sails. They were so amped up to have this legendary fight, the same one I thought I was going to be covering when I started writing this episode. Is this regulation consistent with the second amendment? Turns out that came up for about 5 minutes in this hour long debate. Instead the thrust of the argument was. What are we doing here? The situation's been resolved, right? Now there are two completely separate arguments taking place. First is there's still a case here, and second was the original ban consistent with the second amendment. The liberals were arguing, hey the problem's been solved, we can take a half day, I hear Frozen 2 is pretty good, let it go? Conservatives, on the other hand, took up the mantle that, despite the fact that the law changed and New York's complete caving to gun right lawyers' complaints happened, there was still very much a problem here. This is where you could really tell that the gun rights lawyers had not prepared for an argument not about gun rights though, because they had two separate arguments and oddly enough seemed to undercut each other at every possible point. First, we heard from retired United States Solicitor General Paul Clement, who argued that the Second Amendment issue is still alive and well, because while New York State Rifle and Pistol Association's complaint had been technically met, it was a bit of a be careful what you wish for situation. 
You see, the city had said, okay, you can take your handgun out of the city to ranges, but you have to make sure that your trip is direct and continuous to your destination. If they've agreed, and you agree, that everything but the continuous and uninterrupted has been resolved, and that you've gotten everything you wanted as demanded in your complaint, you can travel to a second home, you can travel to any lawful firing range. Um, that's all your original complaint demanded. If you got all of that, that is the issue that was before us. A new question is whether, and you've agreed, we should leave that to the courts below, what continuous, continuous and uninterrupted is. Now, justices quickly came up with all sorts of reasons that would make a trip not be direct and continuous. And ironically enough, it was quite a detour in the debate. Let me tell you, I have not seen the Supreme Court debate bathrooms this much since I covered transgender rights. The concern was, alright, so the city is now saying, great, bring your gun to a range outside of the city. That's what you wanted. Just don't take the pretty route. Of course, New York City's representative assured us in no uncertain terms that you will still be able to get coffee and go to the bathroom on your way to the range. The city's enforcement position is that coffee stops, bathroom breaks are entirely permissible. Well, under current law. This line of questioning did get slightly more difficult when the Supreme Court asked the age-old question of, why don't you visit your mother anymore? Specifically, alright, so you can grab coffee and go to the bathroom, but can you swing by your mom's house for a few hours on your way to the range? It was weird the number of times visiting your mom came up in this debate. Big Brother's getting a little pushy about visiting family. Maybe check in with your dad once in a while too. Now the answer to this slightly less urgent detour was a resounding, I don't know. It would be up to the state's courts to figure out whether this is reasonable or not. This is a new law. At this point, it might seem like my analysis is not direct and continuous either. But to get us back to the main point with this line of questioning, justices were trying to establish exactly whether, despite the fact that the letter of the complainant's complaint was met, there was still an undue burden being put on handgun owners. It felt like my girlfriend was the complainant here. Okay, you gave me what I said I wanted, but this isn't what I really wanted. Don't worry viewers, she does not tune in. He also argued that if his clients had actually gotten what they wanted, the ban would be declared unconstitutional and they would have unlimited travel outside of New York's jurisdiction with their handguns. So that was the first gun rights lawyer's argument. Then the second gun rights lawyer, Deputy Solicitor General Jeffrey Wall, came out with a very different argument. Sure, the complainants got everything they wanted, but this case can still be heard in court, because now we're suing for damages. Unfortunately for him, this was very much an uphill legal battle, because the guy who had gone directly before him had made clear that the complainants were not in it for the money. They were in it solely for protecting their right to transport arms. The SG tried to give you a, a, a lifeline by saying you could get damages. But I read your um, representations to court and you said we could get damages. I don't see a, a request for relief, either damages or nominal, in your complaint. And you don't say we want damages in your submissions to us. Never fear though, because this new lawyer was equally dismissive of the previous argument. He submitted a brief that said the government reasoned that there's still a live controversy, because challengers could seek money damages from the city. But it rejected the challenger's contention that the case is not moot because the rules remain problematic even after the city's changes. Yeah, this was a weird one to watch because the lawyers who should have been in agreement were being not passive aggressive, but aggressive aggressive towards each other. It was their own separate little legal fight going on. This late stage complete strategy shift might have been even more abrupt than New York City's law change. These gun rights advocates had a long history though of not in the least bit being interested in money. 
damages. Now, to be sure, they're not focused on damages. What they wanted was to engage in the conduct. They wanted an injunction. I mean, not years focused on damages is an understatement. They, they, they practically won't take damages. They've had every opportunity to say that they want damages, including today. And for whatever reason, Mr. Clement has, you know, basically said, this case is not about damages. That's not why we think it's not moot, and that's not what we want. Still, though, to keep the case in the Supreme Court, they'd be willing to change their tune. So you're probably asking, what damages can you incur by not being able to bring a gun outside of the city? Well, get creative, because their lawyer sure did. One is the competitions they were not allowed to attend with the firearms, and the other is the cost of dues and membership fees to the in-city ranges, which I think implicitly they're suggesting are higher than the out-of-city ranges. Mr. Wall of course, this is a bit of a challenge because to change your complaint this late in the game is pretty unprecedented. Of course, they'd argue that, well, New York started it. They fully addressed our concern and changed the law during the period when the Supreme Court was selecting which arguments to hear. So we should be able to change our complaint. There were legitimate damages that occurred because of this old law, so that's my new complaint. So those are the main arguments in the overarching case of whether this is still a case or not. Now on to part two of the video, the part you probably clicked on this video to learn about. Had New York not changed their law, what would this debate look like? Now unfortunately, there was just a shadow of this debate in the background. But using a combination of clips and the appeals court decision, I can piece together the arguments both sides had. New York has two types of handgun licenses. You have the concealed carry license where beep, 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 run wild, carry your handgun anywhere in the country federal law permits. You also have today's handgun permit that's a lot more restrictive called a premises license. This only allows you to have a gun in your home. With that new information, you might have two questions. First, were these guys seriously trying to bring handguns only licensed for use in the home to a target shooting competition with cash prizes? Just commit and get the actual concealed carry permit. That's like bringing a zip car to a street race. More significantly though, why would you let someone with a specific license limiting their possession to inside the home be legally allowed to transport their guns outside the home to a shooting range in the first place? From our perspective, the right question regarding a premises license is did the, did the rule impermissibly burden effective use of the handgun in the premises? In the same way that to get a gun to a premises, you have to get it somewhere outside, uh, you know, purchase it somewhere outside your premises and bring it there. Um, that certain things that happen outside the home may, may be integrally related to effective use of a handgun inside the home. Basically, if you want to allow a person to have a handgun in their house, it would be pretty irresponsible to refuse to train them and let them learn how to use it. The transportation requirements for people who have these home licenses are incredibly strict. The gun has to be unloaded and in a locked box in transit to the shooting range. I mention this because I live in Queens and I don't want my parents to have a small heart attack when they watch this episode. Don't worry mom, I'm fine. This constitutional argument revolves around whether, with an abundant supply of training facilities locally, you can require people who aren't allowed to bring a gun off of their premises to train locally. The ability to train locally in a circumstance where market forces are allowed to operate to determine how many facilities are present where there's no indication that supply was insufficient to meet demand, and where the petitioners here, actually, in their summary judgment affidavits, never even said they wished to engage in any form of regular training outside the city. All they said is they wanted to go to shooting competition, regional shooting competitions out of the city. That on this record, the former restriction or the former rule uh, implementing the premises license to allow fire training locally meets Second Amendment requirements. If it still feels weird that we're trying to bring a gun that can legally only be used to defend one's house to a competition, don't worry, this is going to come back in the anti-gun arguments. Just get the right license though. The gun rights lawyer's argument here goes back to the 2008 case of District of Columbia versus Heller. 
The Heller decision really rewrote how we interpret the Second Amendment gun laws. But oddly enough, it can be either incredibly pro-regulation or anti-regulation depending on, well, how good your lawyer is. This could lead to lower courts having vastly different ideas of what a Second Amendment protected right is than the higher courts. The way the lower courts have interpreted Heller is like text, history, and tradition is a one-way ratchet. If text, history, and tradition sort of allow this practice, then they'll uphold the law. But if text, history, and tradition are to the contrary, then the courts proceed to a watered-down form of scrutiny that's heightened in name only. And I think this court should reaffirm that text, history, and tradition essentially is the test and can be administered in a way that provides real protection. There are two different ways of reading the Hiller decision. First, the pro-gun interpretation which rests on the limits the decision puts on what a jurisdiction can do to regulate guns. This decision did not guarantee a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever in any manner whatsoever and for whatsoever purpose. Well, thank you for that super specific ruling. Liberals can sleep easy tonight. Now that statement is actually a lot more calculated than it sounds, so let's break it down. You're not guaranteed a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever. Jurisdictions can regulate which weapons you can keep and carry, in any manner whatsoever. Okay, so you can force someone to transport their weapon in a manner such as unloaded and in a locked box, like New York does in this law. And finally, and for whatever purpose. The purpose in this case of this license is that you can use a handgun to defend your home. Because we're in a cramped studio apartment here. I don't have space for a shotgun. Also, you can transport your handgun to a range for the purpose of defending your home and training to defend your home. These are the three areas states can regulate. When it comes to banning interjurisdictional transportation, though, without a meaningful purpose, manner, or weapon restriction justification, that's just cramming a square peg into a round hole. Just to keep people from panicking, the Supreme Court in that decision separately said you can continue to ban sales to ex-criminals or the insane and ban people from bringing guns to schools and government buildings. But that didn't really fit in neatly with the catchy three-part regulation slogan, so they kept it separate. With that interpretation explained, you might be wondering now, well how could the appeals court give the thumbs up to this ban? Clearly, it's a regulatory overstep. Well, this brings us to the anti-gun, I'm sure that group has a better name but I don't know what it is, interpretation of this decision. Those courts applied a two-step test created in the Heller decision for determining whether something was legally actionable regarding the Second Amendment. Quoting the appeals court decision, first step, whether the Second Amendment applies at the first step. We proceed on the assumption that the rule restricts activity protected by the Second Amendment. Alright, well reading that, this seems like a losing case. The rule restricts a Second Amendment protected activity. Step 2 must be quite the revelation. Second step, level of scrutiny. At the second step, we consider whether to apply heightened scrutiny. Laws that neither implicate the core protections of the Second Amendment nor substantially burden their exercise do not receive heightened scrutiny. Basically, okay, so this restricts the Second Amendment protected activity, but is it bad enough that we care? Maybe this restricts a protected right, but is it that big a deal or burden? Does this cut at the self-defense core of the Second Amendment? The plaintiff's primary argument is that the right to possess and use guns in self-defense suggests a corresponding right to engage in training and target shooting, and thus restrictions on the latter right might themselves be subject to heightened scrutiny. The lower court looked at this claim and said, yeah, no. We'll protect your right to self-defense, but there are local establishments for you to train and improve your skills. If you're in it for the competitions, well, we can't help you. We make no such assumption, in contrast, regarding the ability to engage in competitive firearm sports. Purely recreational activities of that sort are unrelated to the core Second Amendment concerns. 
Wow, tell us what you really think. So that's what's happening with the most recent gun control debate. We'll see what, if anything, the Supreme Court decides to change about the ways we evaluate the constitutionality of our laws when they release a decision in the spring. Until then, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank this exceptional group of patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the legal arguments of the day, link in the description. Remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the right of my head, or be old school about it and click on the bar down below. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.